So Janet, welcome. Thank you for joining us today to talk about your capstone program as a part of the Master of Music and Music Education Kodai Emphasis Program, which is housed at Lakeland University. Uh, could you tell us, Janet, just a little bit about your background and, and what brought you to, to pursue your master's in this program? So I should start by saying um, I did start to pursue a pursue a master's degree back in 2008 um, at a different school, and it was a Master of Arts program. Um, and my primary goal at that time was to get a pay raise, you know, as we do in our school districts. Um, it was not a music degree, degree program. Um, it didn't offer me any additional certifications. Um, so it wasn't a great fit for me. I think, you know, at, MA programs are valid and really help a lot of people, but it just wasn't right for me. So I took some time off from graduate school and in that time had a couple of children. Um, my job changed a few times and in 2017, which interestingly was my first year as a full-time orchestra instructor, um, I decided I wanted to get my master of music and I wanted to do it right. So um, I, you know, my first thought is I want to go to graduate school and get a master's in music. Um, it's highly relevant to my career. It would challenge my musicianship. Um, but very often those sorts of programs, you have to take time off and go to school full time. And that wasn't really an option for me financially or logistically. So at the time um, I did find Silver Lake College of the Holy Family. They offered an MM in four summers. And uh, it really spoke to me because uh, as a vocal general music methodology person, um, even though I was teaching orchestra at the time, um, had really distinguished instructors. It had really compelling course options. Um, it just seemed just right for me. Um, so I started there. And um, then when the school closed, Lakeland graciously picked up the entire program with the same professors, the same great courses. In fact, I think even more courses now. Um, and the Lakeland staff was super helpful in getting me transferred over and I was able to complete my degree program at Lakeland. So, um, it, and there were so many other things about choosing what was Silver Lake and is now Lakeland. You know, I live in the Madison area. It was only two hours away from me. Um, the summer hours really worked for me as a mom and a full-time teacher, but, you know, having it be close by was like a bonus because people come from all over the country and all over the world to study at this program because it's just so unique and it has such great, um, just, it's just well-respected by so many people. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing, Janet. And, and so tell me before we get any further, if you would share a little bit about your teaching journey. Uh, just, you, you spoke to it a little bit now, but, but it's, it's been a, a journey and I'd love for you to yeah. share just what you've experienced and what's brought you here and what, where you're currently teaching. So, um, I, I think my first year at Silver Lake, I had never had the same job two years in a row. Um, I had been teaching in the Madison Metropolitan School District um, as an itinerant teacher. And every year my job was a combination of general music and strings like elementary strings or general music and middle school orchestra or choir and elementary strings. Like it was never the same two years in a row, but um, there was always a vocal and general music component is at least, you know, 30% of my job would be that every year. Um, and with that, you know, that's when I got interested in sort of the Kodai methodology. Um, I used a lot of fire robend um, methods in my classrooms at that time. Um, but then I transferred to a different school district just outside Madison, uh, the one that I live in. So my kids go to my school now. Um, and I got hired there as a part-time choir teacher. And then the following year, it was like, the same thing, part-time choir and part-time strings. And then finally, my third year in the school district, I uh, did something very bold and I gave up all vocal music education and I jumped all in and now I'm a 612 orchestra educator. So I'm in my sixth year of that job. Um, and my first, her fifth year, fifth year. Um, and my first year in that position was the, that summer is when I started my program at Lakeland. So kind of backwards, you know, my biggest regret is that I didn't do this sooner. Um, it wasn't the right time, um, but I just, my biggest regret is that I wasn't able to, you know, be a full-time vocal teacher using these strategies, but I've sort of found my way around that. We could talk about that too. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So maybe what we can turn to now is uh, really what you just completed in the program. Well, you you just completed the program. Yes. You, have, you are the first to graduate from our Master of Music program here at Lakeland University since the program found its new home here. So 
Congratulations for that, Janet. You go down in the history books um, and we're very proud of you. Uh, but a big part of that, in addition to the coursework throughout the, the program itself, is, is the, the culminating project, which is a capstone project. If, if you would, could you share a little bit about what a capstone project is and what your experience was moving through that? Sure. So um, my capstone project in general, um, I created an orchestra teacher podcast, but a capstone project isn't just, I'm going to create a podcast. It's working alongside your advisors um, to create three separate prongs. So it's three separate distinct parts. And in my case, um, they all worked together to make the greater whole. So um, my first prong in my podcast was a research paper that explored uh, best practices in educational podcasting. And uh, through my advisor, Dr. Brent Galtz, I was able to interview some really successful and prominent music education podcasters to find out things about best practices and engaging listeners and also um, technology needs to do a podcast. So that was my prong one. My prong two, I worked with my advisor, Dr. Sharon Morrow, um, to create a survey, so a data collection process to see what topics um, Wisconsin, specifically Wisconsin orchestra instructors would be most interested in hearing in a podcast um, to help them become better teachers. So I was able to uh, get some really great feedback from that. And then prong three was the podcast itself. So I was able to uh, create content based on some of the feedback from the data and also content that um, would be applicable and engaging that I found in my research for my prong one. And to that, um, I have three published podcast episodes and I have three more in the works. <laughs> so we haven't recorded those yet, but yeah. Um, what I love about the Capstone project for me is it was um, something that I'm not just doing it, closing the book and moving on with my life. Like to me, it's a springboard to do more and just keep, making podcasts and uh, learning through that as well. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a long-term learning process and I got a really great start doing the capstone. That's awesome, Janet. And so the capstone project, I know the faculty in this program, we've really put a lot of thought into that process so that it is a project that is very applied in nature. As you described, it's something that will impact you immediately in your teaching and, and, and contribute to the field uh, very directly. Um, and gosh, I think some other colleagues that have gone through the program as well have done some really exciting projects that uh, are present, they're presenting them at regional conferences, national yep. conferences, or, or, or publishing you know, articles and whatnot. So um, tell me for you, I, I love that idea that this is a living, breathing, thing. It, it isn't just, hey, I wrote a really great paper, valuable as that is, and, and it's done. It's This is the springboard to a really well-researched and, and prepared way to move your podcast forward. Um, what's the current status of the podcast and what's your vision? So right now, um, there are three episodes up um, and I did crowdsource some of the topics for that, um, again, from the data collection. Um, my girlfriend, Jessica, so <laughs> it was, I should also give credit where credit is due. My girlfriend, Jessica had the idea to make a podcast. Um, we are colleagues and friends and we spent a lot of time just gabbing about our jobs and it was her brilliant idea, um, that I was able to turn into this. So Jessica and I are still, um, working together to make more podcast episodes. Um, currently right now we do most of them together is the goal. I did one by myself, um, but yeah, and we're, we're learning together on how to get better and stronger at that. The thing I'm most excited about is um, we kind of envision that what's up right now is going to be season one, um, what we're working on is season one. And then season two, um, through the data collection process, um, I was put in contact with several people who are willing to be interviewed because even though Jessica and I are two brains, right, we still don't know everything about orchestra education and we really want to crowdsource um, people who know more than us and who are willing to share and educate others on something that they specialize in. So that's what prong two or season two is going to be is um, and interviewing really just prominent people and sharing out their great knowledge. That's fantastic. So the, the episodes that you already have created that were a part of the, the capstone project, what are their topics? What are the three episodes on? So the first one is on recruitment and retention um, in string music education. 
Um, and then the second episode is on Kodai in the instrumental classroom, which for me was, the, that's the one I recorded by myself. That's the one that's certainly most applicable to the coursework I did um, over the four years at Lakeland. Um, and that's like, that. I think that just says so much about how like this is a Kodai school, but you know, you can be an instrumental educator and still benefit from it. Um, I just talk about ways, you know, whether you know nothing about Kodai or whether you know a million things about Kodai, like here are some strategies you can use to just integrate as much methodology as you're comfortable with in your orchestra classroom. So that one was really exciting for me to um, come up with content for. And then the third episode is um, tips and tricks for group instruction, just like little catchy things to help kids learn their bow holes or learn um, finger patterns or things like that. So we had some fun bouncing ideas off each other in that episode as well. And how did you prepare for each of those episodes? Because um, I know from behind the scenes that there was a lot of research and a lot of work that <laughs> led to what's, what's a very fun and engaging podcast to listen to, but it's very research-based. Can you tell me about that process? So I think like that, and I'm glad you said that. I think one of my goals was to create something that was listenable and relatable, but also had that credibility that included like the right amount of research to keep you from being, you know, just two girls talking about their jobs, right? So um, I, I that that balance of sort of the academic research and the conversational style is something I strive for. Um, I'm able to just a lot of the stuff I got was um, stuff that I've already read from coursework in the program itself. So it was a nice way for me to tie some of that stuff in. Um, also just researching academic journals on the through the Lakeland Library website has been really helpful. Um, and again, I did interview some people for my first prong and plan to in the future as well. The, the topics that you just described for your podcast, there's a great breadth of, of understanding experience that, that you're addressing, even in those first three episodes. Um, I'm curious, how did the program itself, how did the master's program help prepare you to address such a wide range of, of topics? What, what was the program like and how did it kind of tee you up for such a, a wide ranging final project? I would say that the coursework that, um, you know, like the history of music education course and like the current perspectives course really helped me understand how to approach the research as well as the research methods course, which was like, a really terrific foundation. I, I joked with my professor, Dr. Morrow, that I'm probably ready to write a doctoral thesis after that class. Like she taught so many great strategies. I learned about so many different research methods, but, you know, besides the research how to's and, you know, just working, you, you do a lot of writing, right? So I got better at writing as well. Besides that component, I think just um, the Kodai courses and just, making music with others and doing the folk song research and singing in the choirs, while it doesn't seem like that would be relevant to orchestra education, to me it really was because at the heart of everything that we did in those Kodai methods classes and in the choral ensembles is just joyful music making, which is exactly what Kodai wanted people to do, young people to grow into old people who are joyful music makers. And I think you know, sometimes you do the late nights and the, the late nights of research and writing, and then you wake up the next day and you're singing and dancing for literally eight hours a day at minimum, right? Like that, it, it just brings it all back together. It's this hard work. It's this digging your nose in the research. It's rewriting music and analyzing music. And then it's singing and dancing and laughing and doing the joyful music making. So, you know, kind of both of those things I really hoped to bring to my podcast in the sense that like, this is the hard work, but we're also in a creative field and our ultimate joy at the end of the day, whether you teach choir or general music or band or in my case, orchestra is to create kids who love music and will be lifelong learners of music, right? Like Fire Robin calls it his 30 year plan. I talk about that all the time. I have a fair number of students who will never play violin again when they graduate from high school, but like they're gonna be excited to hear a piece that they know on the radio when they happen to flip through NPR, right? Or maybe they're gonna be willing to like have the skills to play guitar on their own. I always use that example. Someone's gonna YouTube how to play guitar because they were in my orchestra class, even if they never play violin again, you know? <laughs> but just back to the program itself, it's just, you just remember 
why you became a music teacher. And, you know, when you're there for two weeks and it's a hard, intensive two weeks, there's no administrator poo-pooing the work you're doing. There's no one like second guessing the value of what you do because you're surrounded with a group of people who have the same values and have the same love of music that you have. Um, and there's, there's nothing quite like that. And I have no regrets about, <laughs> my only regret is like, not being able to do it for another summer, I guess. So, <laughs> well, you're welcome back, Janet. Okay. We'll, <laughs> we'll find a way. I really to might. <laughs> but you just gave me chills with that answer because I, I know that's what we're what we're all about and the environment that, that we strive to create. But uh, so, tell me, let's go back to the podcast. Um, I'd love to hear what were some of your biggest hurdles in creating the podcast, and how did you overcome them? So, I think the biggest hurdle is that I had never listened to a podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> which is like the funniest part of all of this. Um, you know, the day that Jessica had that suggestion, we were out for like an eight mile run or something. So she suggested it and she had always been a serious podcast listener. And I just never got around to listening to it. My Spotify was completely filled up with music all the time. I just never took the time. And, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, I'm like, why not? I might as well start listening to podcasts. So that was the biggest hurdle. I had never heard one before. So I started listening and actually that was really fun research. Cause I listened of course to music education podcasts, but I also listened to like science and history and comedy and just to get a feel for sort of the pacing and the cadence and which ones, what I liked about each one, or, you know, oh, I didn't really like this podcast. Well, why not? So just sort of learning um, the ins and outs of what a podcast is, which is kind of funny that I didn't have that experience before I decided to dive head first into this. But um, the other part that was tricky for me, uh, another hurdle was just, I'm not super extroverted. And the idea of rec recording myself and putting myself out there to the world was terrifying to me, which is why doing it with my friend who is a much better like self promoter and she can market these things better and is more willing to take up that sort of space. It was, it's a perfect balance. Like I always say we're yin and yang, you know, but um and the other thing that uh, was tricky for me was the technology piece. I had never had to edit audio. I didn't know what kind of microphone to use. I didn't know, I had never designed a website. That that tripped me up because I have a website that corresponds with it. Um, but, you know, I've learned a ton. I still have a ways to go. Um, but that was, the, there was a few hurdles there. But ultimately, like, learning how to do it was really fun. And that's how I knew I picked the right podcast topic. You know, it was, it was fun for me to listen to podcasts, learn about podcasts, do the research about what makes them engaging and um, how to gauge success and all that. And then designing a website. I, I, it was fun. It was overwhelming at first, but it was fun. So. Well, and so far, Janet, I'm curious in, in how your, your work has been received. Have, have you received feedback on the podcast and the, the website that accompanies it? So I have, I've gotten a good bit of feedback, obviously from my advisors and the faculty at Lakeland, but um, I, I've been sharing it slowly with some close friends and they, uh, they've been giving me very helpful feedback. And one of the things that I already mentioned was, you know, this balance between the conversational sort of casual approach and also the, the research component. And to me, that's like the best feedback I've gotten so far. It's been really helpful. Um, and strike finding that strike uh, that strike that balance between listenability and credibility i think are the two um but we um we're hoping to get it spread out a little bit more to more people i sent it to wsma um because they helped me conduct my research they uh very graciously sent out my survey to orchestra teachers on my behalf so um my survey you know soliciting information about what would be of interest to orchestra instructors was largely facilitated by WSMA. So I've given um, the podcast to them and, you know, feel free to share this with others. Um, so hoping to get some feedback that way as well. That's fantastic. And you really struck a nerve, I think, when you did, when WSMA did help and, and yeah. shared out that, that survey, what kind of response did you get when that was sent out? So um, I was told that over 250 surveys were sent out via email. It was a Google form. Um, and I got 61 responses, which is about a 20% return, which is from what I understand, fairly good in the field of research, um, and got some great ideas. There was a part of the survey where people could fill in like what I did. So I should back up. I listed potential topics 
like recruitment and retention was one. Um, alternative styles like jazz and mariachi. Uh, you know, I just listed everything I could think of and my advisor helped me phrase them in a way that was eye-catching and, you know, very summative. Um, and then I left a spot for people to fill in potential topics. And a lot of people had ideas of what they wanted to hear. One that struck a lot of people wanted to hear about social emotional learning in the orchestra setting. Several other people responded and wanted to know about band teachers teaching orchestra, which is one that we are working on right now, because that tends to be a common thing for a lot of uh, student, a lot of newer teachers. They are band instructors, but they have never taught orchestra and they want to do it well and they want to do it right. So yeah, we want to hear about that. Um, and, at, and at the end of the survey as well, there was a spot where people could write in and say if they were interested in um, being interviewed, if they had something they wanted to share. And I had about 21 responses, people either volunteering themselves or saying, hey, you should reach out to so-and-so. I think they'd be good for this. So yeah, we have, I have a lot to work with. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, you've mentioned this a couple times it, it, as we are talking about your capstone project is, is the role of faculty advisors. I'd, I'd love you to elaborate on what that was, as well as even, Janet, more broadly, your connection with faculty and moving through the master's program. What, what kind of connection did you have to the faculty that, that, are, um, that teach the courses in, this, in the whole master's degree? So one thing that did draw me to the program was that the the instructors come from like very acclaimed music schools, um, Indiana, Hart School, places like that. Um, and the program, the cohort is quite small. So it's a first name basis with everyone. You get to know them. You really like sort of they 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 get you and you get them after spending, you know, days in a row together um, in those, you know, intense classes. Um, and many of the teachers teach more than one class. So you'll have your professors for a, a minimum of two, sometimes three, sometimes four years, right? The same people. Um, so you sort of get a feel for, you know, what would be, who you would want to work with in that setting. Um, and then um, another thing that's really great about them is you, you find your people who are gonna help you with your capstone and you meet with them regularly. Um, you have email correspondence, you have Zoom meetings, um, they offer suggestions. I mean, I remember my first draft of my paper had 87 edits or 87 comments. And I thought that was terrible, but I found out, no, that's actually quite good. Like that's that's standard, Janet. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Um, so, and then, um, so, you know, they help you with the writing, they help you with streamlining your thoughts, they help you just get that professional slant to your writing that may otherwise just be hard because some of us, me, I'm talking about me, have been away from college for a long time. I mean, I took a long time between my undergrad and graduate school experience. So um, they help with everything from the research to, you know, the writing component to just being a supportive um, just a supportive force and helping you like guide your way through this. Um, interestingly, my prong two advisor, Dr. Morrow, taught with me in the Madison Public Schools. We, my first year of teaching in 2005, um, <laughs> she was finishing her PhD at the university here. So she was working part time and I was working part time and we were like ships passing in the night at the same school. So I, I mean, I go way back with one of my advisors, which is just so exciting. Um, and she, she was great. She really, she, it's a, they have this way, both Dr. Gall and Dr. Morrow had this way of pushing you and like supporting you, but like pushing you <laughs> to do great things. And that's, that's what you want. You don't, you don't want to coast through this program. You want to get every ounce of knowledge you can get out of it. And that for that, I'm grateful. Absolutely. I love how your relationship with Dr. Morrow came full, full circle. So I know. It was so special. I told some people who were like around back then, you know, because people come and go from string positions and they just couldn't believe it. It was just like total, total serendipity that she was hired by the university. Wow. It was just crazy. So, and we're still friends. I sent her a Christmas card, you know, she'll email me once in a while. <laughs> Are you in, come to Milwaukee? We'll hang out. She's great. <laughs> I love it. So tell me a little bit about, um, boy, because the, the project that you did was, was clearly very involved, very thorough, very comprehensive. However, you did that work. You completed that project really 
largely throughout the academic year. Some of yeah. that that was completed in in the summer following. But it, it, but boy, how did you balance that kind of work with with life, with all that comes with it, with work, family? How did you do that? Um. Well, that was a challenge. But I think what made it less challenging is it was because it was my project. It wasn't someone giving me assignment every week that you have to read this many chapters and do this much stuff. It was my baby. So it was different. And I, I think I started in January of 2021 and finished in November of 2021. So, you know, when I think about January, 2021, we were still, I was still teaching virtually still in COVID school, still doing 14 plus hours of screen time every day. It wasn't great, but again, it was sort of, it was sort of an out from all of the grading and all the thousands of assessments. I had literally thousands of assessments I had to review because we were teaching virtually. I couldn't observe. Right. Um, it, it just felt like a good escape. It was something I could control, I guess, and see the progress of unlike the screen full of, you know, blank faces and SpongeBob icons that my job was at the time. (laughs) So, you know, every kid with their camera off. Um, But so I did a lot of like the research stuff through the fall. And then in the summer, the summer was very intense because we were virtual at Lakeland. um, And I took a lot, I mean, it was a lot of credit. It was a big, heavy credit load. Um, But as a mom and as a teacher, I just tended to do my work you know, a lot of people work late at night. I got up at 4 a.m. every day and did the work. <laughs> I'm just a morning person. So that's when I got it done. Um, but again, it yes, it was work, but I was excited about it. And I had advisors rooting for me. And yes, they put deadlines on me, but it was never one that I couldn't contribute to. You know, it'd be, let's do this in May. And I'd say, how about the second week in May? Okay, sounds great. Like it was very much a collaborative process and not a directive process. So having that level of control over it um, is how I did it in 11 months, a little less. Yeah. Impressive. And, and again, such a cohesive project where, how can people find it? How can people find the podcast? How can they find the website? So, um, it's teaching just one word teaching Um, and there's just a little info on there about me and my colleague, Jessica, my good friend, Um, And of course, all three episodes are there. We're hoping to get episodes four, five, and six in, I'd like to say in the next month, but we've been holding on for about two months. COVID, she got sick, then her family got sick, then school, you know, December as a music teacher happened. So we're working on um, getting at least episode four up by the end of this week, actually. Um, And then uh, five and six are on their way. Those next episodes are uh, games, group games. And then we have one on advocacy, um, which is something that she and I are both very passionate about um, in this kind of post-COVID teaching world and administration, not really understanding the breadth of what we do. Um, And I'm forgetting the sixth one right now, but yeah, we have a lot. We just, we have a Google folder full of ideas and notes. And so we're really excited. I love it. And I can't wait to see where that podcast goes and the new topics that keep coming up. And and so neat to hear that you're continuing to reach out to gather feedback from colleagues across the state in terms of what what they're looking for, what what are they needing? And and you're really filling that gap. You know, could you speak to that for a moment? Because what uh, in terms of filling that gap for where we are in in our state, because I I know one of the things you and I had talked about early in this process is, you know, there there are podcasts out there for orchestral teachers, but a lot of them we're kind of region specific and different yes. than our backyard of Wisconsin. Could you tell me a little bit about, you know, filling the need here, here in our state and how that's different from other podcasts? Yeah. And that was, so that was just it. You, you kind of mentioned it. Um, there are not a lot of orchestra teacher podcasts out there and a good place to start when choosing a capstone is finding a gap. And that was a gap. There just wasn't a lot. There were a couple, but um, the ones I found that are more widely distributed are from teachers in the Southern region of the United States where music programs look very different, um, where you know the middle school has dozens of private teachers who come into school to teach these kids and they rehearse every day and um, we, oh, and they don't have heterogeneous groups, you know, stuff like that. So in, in like what I think is the Midwestern United States um, and especially here in Wisconsin, I can speak to Wisconsin, it's the only place I've taught um, is we teach heterogeneous groups 
We teach large group instruction always. We don't have pullout lessons, um, neither Jessica nor I. Um, she actually took over my one of my old jobs in Madison. That's how we became friends. So, you know, both in her school district and my former school district and my current school district, that's just not a thing. We don't have small group lessons. So there was this gap in content that was specific to, you know, a wider range of learners and teaching, you know, four instruments at the same time uh, that I hadn't found out there yet. Um, and just sort of the nuances of some districts have several strings teachers and because Wisconsin has a lot of smaller populations, some school districts have one and they don't even have a colleague to bounce ideas off of. So that was another thing that we considered um, kind of giving a voice to music teachers and kind of trying to create this community in Wisconsin um, where again, orchestra education looks very different than it does in other places. Fantastic, thank you, Janet. So um, let's, let's think about the master's. I'd like to just reflect with you for a moment, the master's program at Lakeland University kind of at large. Um, and what do you, is the program transition to Lakeland? I'd love to hear what your experience was through that process. And, and um, last summer, of course, was virtual, yet at Lakeland due to COVID, and that's not the intent moving forward. We, we were excited to come back to our in-person formats. Um, but what was your experience in working with staff and, of course, the same faculty here in that transition? I mean, the only thing that had changed really to me was the name of the school at that point. The teach I already had a relationship with all the professors coming into this. They all knew me. I knew them. Everything was great. The transition just felt really smooth and natural. Um, I was still attending school with the same people. So there was no real change in learning new names and faces, except of course the new cohort coming in. Um, when, I, when the transfer process needed to be completed, um, I was really easy to work with people at Lakeland. They were really easy. I mean, I would send an email and five minutes later get a response. Like the transfer process was super simple. Um, but you know, the program itself, it was literally picked up and just moved to another spot, you know, it, and I mean, very much to Lakeland's credit, more courses are offered with the ORF program coming in and some really um, great special topics courses that just totally look amazing and worthwhile for anyone to teach, to take, even if they're not enrolled in the program. I mean, you know, so really, and again, the, just the credibility of the people who, you know, we put some of the professors on a pedestal because they're very well known in their fields, but the fact is they're extremely approachable and knowledgeable and willing to help you learn and make great strides. So, yeah. Fantastic. So um, let me, let me ask you this question, Janet, and that's, that's simply what's next for you. Where, where do you go from here? You finished this <laughs> master's program, this very rigorous master's program with this, this excellent um, you know, capstone project that I think is going to have a life of its own. Where do you see all of this leading you in your career? So I, I made a joke. It's what's next. And that's just keep doing what I do. Um, I have the best job in the world. I say that often. Um, I never really set out to be a full-time orchestra instructor, um, even though I've played violin my whole life. Um, it was never my intent and now I'm in it to win it and I have the best job. So part of me wants to just keep doing what I do. I will say that I have sort of explored um, maybe doing some arts administration work, um, just getting a certification in that. Um, I don't think at this time I'm gonna pursue a PhD but I, do, I don't think I'm done learning either. Um, I sort of see myself looking at arts administration or potentially uh, national boards, something like that. But I, I don't really wanna leave the classroom, at least not yet, cause I'm just, I'm really enjoying my time. And one of my kids is already my student and the next, my daughter's on her way up to being my student. I just wanna be there with them, so. That's, that's fantastic, that's fantastic. So, um, Last question for you, just again, coming back to the program uh, in general, Dana, would you recommend the Masters in Music program to other educators? And if so, what are the highlights? Why would you do so? I would absolutely recommend it. I'm just amazed at the things I've learned. Um, it's just amazing to watch how my own personal lesson plans have changed for the better and how my students have benefited from that. Um, and I don't, again, I've said this, I'm not like the target audience for this program because I'm no longer a choral and general music teacher, but I just, I just feel that it's good for everyone, even as instrumental teachers, because, you know, could I says 
singing is the first form of musical engagement. And I, I have very strong feelings, you know, after leaving the program and also after doing the research for the podcast, that we, regardless of the modality of music that we teach, we have to have a good pedagogical sequence, a good methodology foundation, and integrate singing whenever possible. That's just always been my philosophy. So while I'm not a choral and general music teacher, I think band and orchestra teachers anywhere and everywhere would benefit from this program. Um, other things I really liked, I just liked tapping into my music brain. You know, that was something I had let, you know, you could kind of let that go when you're just in the grind of teaching school 180 days a year, year after year. Um, I really liked the musicianship piece. I love solfege. I love music theory. Um, I love choral methods. I love all those things. So I also really uh, surprised myself with how much I enjoyed the folk song collection process as well. Um, you know, I, the, and the other piece, I keep talking about the professors, but I, I, I really do have to mention the people that I went to school with, my fellow students. You were, I was, I almost, I struggled with imposter syndrome like a lot because I just felt like everyone was just so much more brilliant than me because they are. When you put that many passionate, excited educators in one space, like the cumulative brain power of that is just indescribable. Um, and I'm in touch with my cohort friends several times a week, sometimes every day. I, we have a group chat going, we talk all the time. I'll reach out to them and say, hey, I'm doing a dance unit with my high schoolers or playing dance repertoire. They will not dance. What's like the most basic folk dance I can do? Please give me any suggestions you got. Or, oh, I'm, I was gonna teach this folk song. Now we know it's not really appropriate. Does someone have a substitute that also teaches, you know, 16th notes in this way? You know, we help each other out with repertoire. We help each other out with just like roadblocks. And sometimes someone will send a text blast. It's like, I've just had the worst day. Someone tell me something funny that a kid did in your class today. You know, you just, so from like sharing repertoire, sharing strategies to get over some rough terrain in your own jobs, you just meet so many great people and just make those connections. So yeah, it's, I, I can't say enough good things about it. Boy, Jen, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that too. The community that is developed is, is second to none. And one of the things I think that makes it so special. So I'm glad that, that you were able to share your experience in that way. Jen, is there anything else that you'd like to add either about uh, your capstone, the blog or your experience in general in the program? No, I mean, it's, it's just a great, it's been a great privilege and a wonderful opportunity. And I, again, not only was it self-serving in that I'm a better musician now, but my students are just more engaged, excited learners. And I feel really good about the progress they're making. And I wish I could go back and like, I wish I did it sooner. So like all the other hundreds of students I've taught would have benefited from it as well. But um, you know, moving forward, I just, I think I have a lot of great years ahead of me because of the program. So. Fantastic. Well, Janet, you mentioned that, you know, that you're not done learning. And so um, I look forward to being in touch and inviting you back for some of those special topics courses that you <laughs> yeah, mentioned. We, we are working really hard to have a really just a meaningful wide array of those courses and to be an ongoing source of professional development for teachers in the region. And so I look forward to soon, hopefully welcoming you physically to campus here, Janet, um, because you've been a joy in the program. Um, and just, it, it's it's hard to, to really wrap my head around the fact that you're finished. You completed. You're our first. You're our first graduate. So um, we're just so proud of you. And I say we, meaning that on behalf of the entire faculty, um, your colleagues in the program too. We we are proud to to call you that first graduate, and and can't wait to see what does come next. And and hope you stay in touch and make sure to to keep keep the program and all of us informed, so we can celebrate your successes and the success of your students too into the future. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a joy. So thank you so much.